Uh, I, I, I recognize some familiar faces here. And that's a good thing. It means uh, you're not just leaving and never coming back. So um, I'm curious. Uh, thank you, Mark, by the way. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here to help Mark get started with the. I've been dealing, dealing with the Howard County Historical Society for many years now. Um, how many of you are from the Laurel area? Go back to at least 60s or 70s. Not that many. Okay. But you all have heard of George Wallace. Yes. And you all know what happened, right? Okay. So the main focus, I'm going to explain exactly what happened, but we're going to kind of skip through that because I want to get to uh, the investigative files. So um, I waited about a year uh, with a Freedom of Information Act request to get these files. And so we're going to go through those. And well, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. So first, I'm going to give you our um, bona fides on the History Boys. If you've already seen this, I apologize. You're probably saying, oh, no, not again. But you know, we got to make sure you guys know that I'm not just some Yahoo. So, you know, <laughs> um, let's see. Does one exclude the other? No, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, the old Laurel leader, which, you know, died a painful death. Uh, I wrote for the leader for 10 years, writing about local history. But now I write for our newspaper. Um, we call it the Laurel Chronicles. Um, it's on our website. I have copies here of the latest issue. It's free. Feel free to grab one on the way out. But I'm also an historical researcher, and most of my research clients are book authors, like the ones you see here. Uh, that's kind of off the... Let me, let me fix that. Hold on. While I'm doing this, I can tell you a story about this one here. Again, I apologize if you've heard all my jokes before, but... Uh, this, this one here, I got a call from a guy, an email from a guy in Spain, this author, and uh, he said he was going to write this biography of this guy, Juan Ramon Jimenez, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. And I said, well, I can help you, but I don't speak Spanish. He said, that's okay. You know, he sent me down to the Library of Congress and was looking through files and everything, and he said, if you ever just see his name, just copy it. So that's what I did. And then when the book came out, I'm in the acknowledgement section, but I have no idea what it says. So um, I'm hoping it's something good. But I also do research for uh, films and TV shows, like the ones here. And now you all don't look like the demographic that watches Ancient Aliens, but I can tell you with confidence that the people behind the scenes are every bit as weird as the people that you see on TV. That is a weird group of people. But I am uh, very excited about a film that's going to be uh, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival on June 12th. It's called The Space Race. And I did extensive research for this film, which tells the story of the pioneer black astronauts. And eventually the film will be shown on National Geographic and Disney+. Plus. So you can look for that. Now, a couple of my clients have asked me to appear on their shows. So here's a short clip from American Detective with Lieutenant Joe Kenda. And my part was filmed at Savage Mill, believe it or not. I'll explain that to you after this. Can everybody hear that? Okay. who is a private care nurse, is reporting for duty. Her charge is a 26-year-old Jasmine Gilbert who suffers from cerebral palsy. Hello, This is extremely unusual. She expects to be greeted as she usually is. Oh, good morning, Anne. But the place is quiet, very, very quiet. Hello? Hello? She goes for the back door, the patio door. 
the door is unlocked. James? Tina? And no one answers her calls. James? she was the one that found the bodies and found this horrific bloody scene in the bedroom. The show was about a murder that happened in, if you're familiar with Laurel, uh, the Oxford Green Apartments, which are right next to the Parkway, across the street from the Montpelier Shopping Center. It's, they're not Oxford Green anymore. I don't know what they're called now. Everything's changed. But that's, that's where it happened. It was not filmed there. I don't know where they filmed that. But they called me and they said they needed someone to talk about the town. Would I be willing? I said, sure. And uh, so they set it up. And if you're familiar with Savage Mill, the part that extends out towards the bridge, it's really long. It's like as long as a football field, if not longer. And there's an attic, which I didn't know. And it was, they did it up there. It was pitch black, except for their, camp, their, their lights. And so we sat down and I said to them, you realize you're not in Laurel, right? And they said, yeah, we don't care about that. I said, okay, all right, all right. Just want to make sure you got it. So anyway, oh, hold on. Before I, I wanted to, for the next clip, I want to turn this up a little bit, excuse me. Yeah, I've had my, uh, my taste of Hollywood and it's, it, it really makes you wonder how they do anything. Okay, anyway. Um, but I've been very lucky in my career as a researcher. Um, I've worked for both a Pulitzer Prize winner and an Oscar winner. Actually, two Oscar winners now. That's Space Race. That company has won a number of Oscars. But on the left there, that's um, Carolyn Fraser. She wrote Prairie Fires, which was a biography of Laura Ingalls Wilder. And this guy here, he won an Oscar for, not for what I helped him with, but for another documentary called Inside Job. For him, I helped him with a documentary about Watergate. But uh, the Oral History Boys is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to bring history to you. We don't have a museum. We don't have an office. Oliver's on Main Street is really our corporate headquarters. So, but we do that in a variety of ways. We have a website. We have a, a very active Facebook page, community presentations like this. We do videos um, and any other project that we can think of. Our problem is we can't say no, and that gets us in trouble. <laughs> But here's our website where we have pages of stories and photos, along with contributor pages, uh, oral histories, much, much more. But most importantly, everything is free. Everything we do is free, with one exception, and I'm getting to that. But we also publish a newspaper, quarterly newspaper called Voices of Laurel. There are copies here. Help yourself on your way out. As I said, it's a quarterly. It, uh, we. We usually have a lot of stories in there about Howard County. We have a number of writers who like that. It's a volunteer paper. No one, including us, gets paid for it. Um, printing costs are paid with a grant. So, um, but we've been very happy with that. But we're not the only ones. It's also free on our website if you want to download it. And the only thing we charge for are our books. That helps fund all these different projects. We have three books out already. The first was Lost Laurel. Uh, which documented the retailers that we all remember in the area but are now gone. And Lost Laurel sold out very quickly a few years ago. The second book is Postmark Laurel, a collection of postcards from Laurel's history. Our biggest project to date, although that's quickly being surpassed by our current one, but I'll get to that, was our third book, Laurel at 150. Uh, we use stories to reflect Laurel's history and diversity. And it provides a portrait of the people of Laurel who have displayed a commitment to service and a dedication to their town for 150 years. I have both the Laurel 150 and the postcard books here. If you're interested, you can purchase that today. We were awarded two governor's citations by Governor Larry Hogan, one for our Laurel 150 book and the other for our newspaper. Also, the Maryland Historical Trust awarded us a Maryland Preservation Award for Excellence in Community Engagement. And we're very honored by all that. And I wanted to show you the video here that they showed at the award ceremony about the book. I'm Richard Friend. I'm Kevin Leonard. I'm Pete Lemus. Here are the Laurel History Boys. 
Our mission is to bring history to you. I'm a graphic designer and a local historian. I'm a researcher and I write the History Matters column in the Laurel Leader. I'm a collector of historical memorabilia from Laurel. He's in ZZ Top. After too, five years out. of collaborating, we created a nonprofit organization utilizing archival preservation, photography, oral history, and presentations to convey the historical experiences of Laurel, Maryland. We find and share the stories you don't always discover in the newspapers and museums. For 2020, we're producing Laurel at 150, a 200-plus page commemorative book celebrating Laurel's 150th anniversary. We're extremely proud of this project, and we were honored to receive a governor's citation for our work on the book. We look forward to continuing our work and expanding our reach to engage an even wider audience. We have a few more books in the works. As I said, we just can't say no, and it's a real problem. Uh, we're working on a book about Meriwether Post Pavilion's first 50 years. We're also working on books about the history of the Laurel Police Department and the history of retail in the greater Laurel area. Um, but our Laurel 150 project has, is being surpassed by our current project, which is a book that's celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Capitol Center. We were contacted by some folks that were connected with that, and uh, they wanted us to do that. So here's our video announcement for the book. to rubble, and the Prince George's County landscape was changed forever. Twenty years later, the Laurel History Boys are going to Largo, produced in partnership with the Poland family and the University of Maryland University Libraries. We're proud to announce Capital Center, a retrospective, a 200-plus page hardcover book that will be a treasure trove of all things Capital Center. artifacts, ephemera, and oral histories, this book will help preserve the memories and legacy of the Capitol Center for generations to come. It will also be a key vehicle to help the Poland family and the University of Maryland expand the Capitol Center archive. And that's where you come in. We need you to start digging through your attics and basement crawl spaces, your photo albums and old ticket stub collections. Whether you are a Capitol Center employee, a regular event attendee, or only went to one or two memorable shows, we want to see anything and everything related to the Capitol Center, from its earliest days to its final years as the U.S. Air Arena. Please contact us at laurelhistoryboys at gmail.com. So just to show you, 
what kind of research we do when we started doing this book. We found in the movie Rocky, the first one, not the 10th or 11th one, but in the movie Rocky, there's a scene um, where over Rocky's shoulder is a boxing uh, poster, and it's from Capital Center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to have that in the book, too. Uh, but I've spent the last two months interviewing uh, mostly ex-employees, and boy, do I have some stories. Um, well, if I get in on that, we'll never get to the other one. So anyway, but I'm here to talk about the biggest news story in Laurel's history. When a major presidential candidate was shot during a campaign rally at the Laurel Shopping Center. Now, was anyone there? Okay. But for, let's start with a little background on the event. This little clip is going to tell you everything you need to know or have probably forgotten about what happened. In March of 1972, a young man living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, took the first step of a fateful journey. Now I start my diary, Arthur Bremer wrote of my personal plot to kill by pistol either Richard Nixon or George Wallace. From uh, his earliest pretty sad childhood, Arthur Bremer was this pathetic loner, isolated, uh, he had no friends. He grew up, uh, went to Milwaukee uh, primary, secondary school. Uh, was always considered to be, as uh, people said, weird. A weird individual who clearly was probably mentally ill. No one ever noticed me nor took interest in me as an individual with the need to receive and give love. In junior high school, I was an object of pure ridicule for my dress, withdrawal, and asocial manner. Dozens of times I saw individuals laugh and smile more in 10 to 15 minutes than I did in all my life up to then. In his life, I think, a uh, kind of turning point was when he had his first crush on a girlfriend. And uh, at first she was interested, and then when she turned him aside, then he became obsessed with this, with somehow getting her to notice him. And he did all kinds of strange things. In January was when he had long hair, and then he went to extreme, and he shaved it off, and he was shaved completely bald. And he shaved his hair, which was long at one time, until oh. it was completely bald? He wanted her to notice him, and to uh, he became obsessed with making a name for himself. Life has only been an enemy to me. I will destroy my enemy when I destroy myself, but I want to take part of this country that made me with me. Well, how are you going to make a name for yourself? I mean, this is a part-time busboy, a janitor. Um, he decided to kill somebody. What's a good title for this manuscript? A month in the life of nobody in particular. George Wallace's 1972 run for the presidency began with a Democratic primary in Florida. He quickly locked onto an issue that was dividing the nation. The recent Supreme Court decisions affirming the use of busing to desegregate schools. This matter that they've come up with of busing little children to achieve racial balance is the most asinine, atrocious, callous thing I've ever heard of. that if I win the Florida primary, that Mr. Nixon himself will step in and stop the busing of school children throughout the United States. And I bet you that when he was in Red China, he and Mouse had tongue talked more about busing than anything else, if you want to know. Stand up for America, little man. George Wallace carried every county in the state of Florida you're saying what the others would say if they have the guts to stay. Listen, rich. Listen, poor. Let's put little George inside the White House. The average citizen has spoken in the state of Florida. They're going to speak throughout the United States. 
I'm a serious candidate for the presidency on the Democratic ticket in the primaries, and it looks like we're going to Miami with the greatest number of delegates. Thank you very much. The Florida primary sent him out of there with a, just like on a rocket for the 1972 presidential elections. Less than 48 hours after Wallace's victory, President Nixon addressed the nation. I am sending a special message to the Congress tomorrow. I shall propose legislation that would call an immediate halt to all new busing orders by federal courts. A moratorium on new busing. On March 23rd, George Wallace held a rally in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Arthur Bremer was there. I figured Wallace would be dead or dying now if I wanted it so. After he gave the liberals hell, he stood in the open and waved and smiled. The audience stood. Some turned to leave, some to move in for a closer view. I moved in and for the first time saw his face. He looked heavily wrinkled and ugly. That would have been it. I had sort of expected this sort of thing to happen sooner or later, because when you heat up the, the political uh, environment to the extent that Wallace does, you're going to uh, bring a lot of kooks out of the woodwork. He always had told me that he realized he might be shot running for president. He, that was very real to him. And he said, I, I realized that might happen. But he always believed it would be a head injury and that he would die. May 13th, 1972. Arrived at Dearborn Youth Center at 15 after 6. The hall was packed. You just can't go around preaching hatred, however you cloak it, in, however you dress it up, and somehow or another it will not come back to bite you. Two 15-year-old girls had gotten in front of me. Their faces were one inch from the glass that would shatter with a blunt-nosed bullet. They were sure to be blinded and disfigured. I let Wallace go, only to spare those two stupid, innocent, delighted kids. We pounded on the window together at the governor. There'd be other times. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The momentum from Wallace's Florida win had continued to grow. He took a strong second in Wisconsin after only eight days of campaigning. We've come a long way from eight years ago when uh, the Democratic candidate uh, called me something evil because I advocated that which he advocates now. And I think that by the time we get to November, some of the leadership is going to be saying, well, you know, uh, I just didn't understand Wallace. He's really a better fellow than I thought. I really didn't know him so well. <laughs> Next was another strong second in Pennsylvania higher poll numbers, and overflowing crowds. Soon, the press predicted more Wallace victories in upcoming elections. On the morning of May 15th, Wallace departed for his last day of campaigning in the Maryland primary. When we left the governor's mansion that day, my husband had already started talking about, he was nervous. He was just extremely nervous. And he just kept saying, I don't think I'm going to go. I just don't think I'm going to make this trip. He said, one more day of campaigning is not going to make any difference. If I haven't won it now, I'll, I can't win it with one day of campaigning. Wallace set aside his concerns and headed north for two final rallies. At the first, a news cameraman focused on a familiar figure dressed in red, white, and blue. That's at Wheaton Plaza. Arthur Bremer, standing close to the stage, asked one of the men guarding Wallace, 
could you get George to come down and shake hands with me? But Wallace never mixed with the mostly hostile crowd. Instead, he and his entourage pushed on to Laurel, Maryland. I came into the rally late at Laurel, Maryland. George was already speaking. And it was a very calm crowd, very nice, congenial crowd. Everything just seemed really nice. So he came down and he started shaking hands. The Secret Service agent in charge asked Wallace not to go into the crowd. That's all right, Wallace said. I'll take the responsibility. And then all of a sudden I heard da 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 da. And then time just stood still. I thought they'd shoot him again, and so I jumped on top of him and trying to cover up his head and his heart and his vital organs, his lungs. And uh, there just wasn't anybody around him. Well, the Alabama bodyguard had been shot and blown out, knocked down. And the Secret Service agent that was, these two were supposed to protect his body, got shot in the jaw and was vomiting and vomiting blood. So I just kept saying, uh, he was dazed and he didn't speak. And I kept saying, George, I'm going to take you home. I'm going to take you home. And uh, we're going home now. And uh, finally, all of a sudden, somebody was pulling me away from him. I kept begging him. I said, "Let don't take me away from my husband now. Please don't take me away from my husband now. <laughs> I was able to get in the ambulance, and they put George in, and the Alabama State Trooper docked in on another stretcher. I think I was in a courtroom, and somebody came in and said that Wallace had been shot. There were all around Selma that day, folk who disliked George Wallace intensely were praying that he recover. They didn't want him dead. Uh, and they, they, there, there was no rejoicing among black Alabamians that George Wallace had been shot, but there was a lot of the chickens have come home to roost. You heard that everywhere. Wallace, by the mid-1960s were certainly aware that he was a figure in danger. That is, we'd had the assassination of, of Kennedy, the two Kennedy brothers and Martin Luther King, and he often talked about the danger that he had. But I think he always anticipated the kind of uh, political ideologue, somebody who opposed him, uh, um, finding him at some moment and shooting him. George Wallace, the most intensely ideological political candidate of the 1960s, ends up being shot by somebody who just wants to get his picture on the front page of the New York Times. Now, some of the people you saw in the footage from Laurel Shopping Center will be part of this discussion as we go along. That clip is from an outstanding documentary called Setting the Woods on Fire it was on uh, PBS. And uh, you can get it online, but it, it's, it's excellent. Very well done. So Wallace's day started with a rally at Wheaton Plaza where he faced a hostile crowd. His segregationist views ignited the crowd into throwing tomatoes and cursing the candidate. A Secret Service agent assigned to the Wallace protective detail recalled the, the Wheaton rally. Now, all of these are out of the FOIA uh, investigative files that I got. So just so you know where this all came from. Uh, the Secret Service agent said, quote, during the governor's speech, he was constantly interrupted by demonstrators who vocally attempted to drown him out. Officer E.C. Dothard, who would, later be sh would be shot later in the day by Bremer, blocked the tomato, which was thrown directly at the governor. An orange was thrown, which missed the governor by one foot. There had been eggs thrown at the platform prior to our arrival. And it's kind of hard to make out, but so this sign says Wallace for president, Hitler for vice president. 
This was at, at Wheaton. Wheaton was not a receptive crowd that day. Wallace arrived in Laurel ahead of schedule, so he rested and lunched in room 502 at the Howard Johnson Hotel on Route 1. After lunch, according to the news leader, Mrs. Wallace had her hair coiffed by Edward at Montgomery Ward Beauty Salon in the Laurel Shopping Center. Wallace arrived at the shopping center in this campaign car. So the events that followed on May 15, 1972, when Arthur Bremer shot presidential candidate George Wallace in the parking lot of the Laurel Shopping Center, have been recounted numerous times, especially in the Laurel Leader, the local paper. I was there. I was a senior at Laurel High School. Hell, the whole school was there. Uh, everybody left after lunch. I mean, how, how often does a presidential candidate come to town? Um, it was what I remember. I don't remember anything about the speech because I was standing. If you, does anybody, you, you remember Laurel Shopping Center, the old part? I was standing on the sidewalk that runs from what well, was People's then um, towards the liquor store, uh, somewhere along there. And it just what I remember is the chaos. Everybody just started running. As you can see, in the, in this, it kind of gives you an indication of how many students were there. They, they, the whole school was there. But there was very little reported about the investigation conducted after the shooting that led to Bremer's conviction. In 2015, I wrote a column about the investigative files that I told you that were provided to me by the Prince George's County Police Department and the FBI. They gave me enough material to fill a whole Xerox box. Like everyone else in Laurel, I followed the coverage of the shooting and the subsequent trial closely, as well as all the articles over the years since, but I was amazed at how much information was contained in the investigation files that was new to me. It took me a few weeks to go through all the interviews with eyewitnesses, police, Secret Service agents, and medical personnel, along with investigation reports and photos. This turned out to be one of the most widely read History Matters columns that I wrote for the leader. The Prince George's County Police Department was out in force that day working the event, and Wallace also had 18 Secret Service agents and a few Alabama State Troopers at his side. The FBI was not present, but later managed the investigation in conjunction with the PG Police Department. The files reveal a police force exhibiting extraordinary thoroughness and professionalism under extreme circumstances in an era much different than today, uh, without the benefit of modern technology. An example of that was recalled by two shopping center employees I interviewed who were working the day of the shooting. One was working in the Melron Fabric Shop, if you remember that, and the other in the photomat booth. Both had reporters demand to use their telephones to call the story in. So here's an aerial photo of the Times, uh, just to set, kind of get you oriented here. So the iconic giant food sign, that's always been there since the place opened in 56. Here's the photomat booth. There's the bank, and the stage was facing this way. Okay, and here's Route 1. This is the old IHOP. And there's that company. For many days afterward, the employee in the photomat booth also remembered many out-of-town visitors stopping at the booth, which was, I just showed you, located in the middle of the parking lot, and asking where it happened. After pointing it out, she said one couple even took turns taking pictures of each other lying on the pavement where Wallace fell. But the focus of the talk today is on the investigative files. The first batch contains civilian eyewitness interviews. Immediately following the shooting, the PG Police Department established a temporary command post in the basement of the Equitable Trust Bank, which is now the Bank of America, uh, the site where Wallace was gunned down. It's unclear how they determined who to interview, but the files contain dozens of interview reports with civilian eyewitnesses and others. Here's some trivia for you. So, you're all aware of the Bank of America now in the middle of the shopping center. This was the bank. When the Berman brothers, who bought, who, I'm sorry, who developed Laurel Shopping Center, when they bought the land, there were already four houses on that particular piece of land that were going to be part of Fairlawn, which is the housing development behind it. Part of the deal was they had to buy those houses too. They demolished three of them. The fourth one just happened to be sitting right smack in the middle, so they turned it into a bank. That was originally a house. 
You can see the chimney here. They just added a drive-through on, on one side. But there's the platform where he was speaking. And there's the perimeter that they, well, that perimeter came up here before. Uh, do you know whose helicopter protected here? Yeah. No idea. No idea. It was in the investigative file, so who knows? It could have been a, a media for all, for all I know. Now, there are discrepancies in many of the interviews as to details of the incident, such as how many shots were fired, the route Wallace took from the stage to shake hands with the people, and even the description of Bremer. William Taff, a reporter for the Washington Star, told police he noticed Bremer because he had, quote, a real funny laugh. He laughed at inappropriate times. One detail that was not in dispute was described in many of the interviews. Once the crowd realized that Wallace had been shot, a bloodlust for Bremer's head started. Leon Skovich told police that, quote, the crowd quickly pounced on the assailant and according to Skovich, we're going to kill the assailant. According to Ernest Leith's interview, quote, the crowd was screaming, kill him, kill him. Dave Mitchell, currently the chief of the University of Maryland Police Department, was in attendance. Mitchell, a Laurel resident, was a rookie cop with the PG Police Department at the time and was off duty. In a recent interview with me, Mitchell added a chilling note to this detail. He said some enraged supporters were, quote, attempting to disarm the policemen so they could shoot Bremer. He also, I've known Dave Mitchell since before he was a cop. Uh, we worked at a gas station together in, in high school. And uh, he told me that it was, he was a rookie cop that just joined the force and he was in plain clothes, but he had his gun with him. And when the shooting started, his instinct was to run to see if he could help, but then he realized they're not gonna know I'm a cop. So he stopped because he had a gun on him. And so, you know, he thought, no, that, that's not a good idea. There were quite a few interviews with students from Laurel Senior High, Hammond Middle, and Laurel Junior High. Because as I said, it was a school day, not that that mattered, but they were all there. Another Laurel High School student, sophomore Bill Beckelman, had a terrifying experience that day. Beckelman, who is currently the senior pastor at Cavalry Chapel Coastlands in Eatontown, New Jersey, this is Bill here, was standing in the back of the crowd near People's Drug Store when the shooting started. Like everyone else in the crowd, Beckelman turned and ran. He ran into a man who grabbed the 16-year-old and twisted his arm behind his back and shoved the gun into his ribs. While the man led him away, Beckelman's mind was racing. He thought it was being taken hostage. In the chaos, no one really knew what was happening. That's the part I remember. He was put in a police wagon with other people, and the wagon raced down Route 1 to Hyattsville. He was relieved to learn from the others that they had been picked up by the Prince George's Police Department. His relief was short-lived, however. When the wagon stopped and the doors opened, he told me there must have been 15 officers pointing shotguns at us. Everyone in the wagon was interviewed and released. Beckelman's parents asked the officer if he could keep the interview out of the record for their son's sake. Apparently, the officer complied since it's not in the files that I saw, but Bill told me this himself. Someone who was not interviewed was Laurel resident Joe Kundrat who was attending the rally with his mother and was right up front when the shooting took place. Kundrat took some of the most famous photos of the day, which were bought by the Associated Press and other media organizations and appeared in newspapers and magazines around the world. Joe recalled aiming his camera under the policeman's arms to get a photo of Bremer being wrestled to the ground. His mother went to the aid of the Secret Service agent who was shot in the neck and fell near her. Uh, on our website, I, I've known Joe forever too, on our website, uh, Joe has a history contributor page and a whole bunch of his Wallace photos are on there if you're interested, check it out. The thoroughness of the investigation was evident in the follow-up interviews. An eyewitness told police about a conversation he had with the manager of Suburban Airport on Brockbridge Road, which recently closed, if you're aware of where that is, about a suspicious person at the airport. Police tracked down the manager uh, who remembered a conversation with someone who fit Bremer's description who asked if Governor Wallace would be landing there. Even in these days before the internet, scams and crooks took advantage of any event. Bridget and Walter Hawkins were standing directly behind Bremer and they were interviewed by newspapers. This is them here. When Mrs. Hawkins was interviewed by police the day after the shooting, 
She told them they had already been contacted by someone in Delaware who asked them to attend the Wallace rally and tell the story of the shooting. Follow-up interviews in Delaware revealed there was no such rally. There are also dozens of interviews in the files with Secret Service agents and policemen. Wallace's path for the day can be traced through the interviews and interesting details about his security are revealed. The Wheaton rally put the security detail on edge. No one knew Brummer had been there stalking Wallace and left afterwards for Laurel. It's interesting that even trained police had a difficult time describing the nondescript Bremer. One of the Alabama state troopers told his interviewer that Bremer looked like an albino. After the Wheaton rally, the security detail was on the lookout in Laurel for potential troublemakers, particularly hippies. Hippies were mentioned more than a few times in police interviews as a matter of concern. Agent Roger Warner said he noticed that two hippie types were of an unusually rough appearance that attracted my interest. Agent James Mitchell had a conversation regarding hippies and walked around to the other side of the stage and observed some hippies. That was us. The Secret Service was so concerned that they tried to convince Wallace to cancel his Laurel appearance. Governor Wallace told the New York Times in 1975 that he ignored Secret Service advice not to appear at the Maryland Shopping Center rally where he was shot while campaigning in 1972. The most riveting part of the whole file are the recollections of the officers nearby Wallace when the shooting started. The coolness under fire and ability to remain professional in such a chaotic and dangerous environment is remarkable. Agents Mitchell and Ralph Peppers were among the first to get to Bremer. Mitchell recalled that he turned and saw a hand with a weapon in it. I lunged or hit and it pulled the assailant by the back of the neck and pulled him toward me in the ground. I fell or jumped with my knees on his back. Peppers described how he pushed him down to the ground and held his head to the ground, but his face was turned partially to one side. I did this to subdue him. Lieutenant Police, I'm sorry, Laurel Police Lieutenant Archie Cook shielded Wallace with his own body after Mrs. Wallace was pulled off to prevent any further shooting. The book, Brass Buttons and Gun Leather, A History of the Laurel Police Department, which is the book we're redoing about the Laurel Police Department, written by former LPD Sergeant Rick McGill, who I also graduated high school with, described what happened next. Quote, Wallace saw Cook's pistol in his belt holster and thought he was the shooter until he identified himself as a Laurel policeman. Wallace asked Cook how bad he was hit. Cook could see the blood, but told him he'd be okay. Secret Service agent Robert Immorati was right behind them and recalled, I saw a pistol on the ground within reaching distance of the suspect. I immediately stood on the weapon. After several seconds, I decided to ensure, I'm sorry, I decided to secure the weapon to avoid loss of it to the crowd. When he relinquished the custody of the gun for safekeeping, he noted on the report, Butt of pistol had a paste on decal of a happy face. The next batch, investigation reports, are a mishmash of forms and interviews, mostly about Bremer's background. This was a diagram of the crime scene that the police did, maybe or the FBI, I don't know, one of them. You can see, again, uh, I was told that um, by one of the other lower policemen who was there that day, that when he came down, the, the, the steps of the, the platform are on this side. He came down and turned this way to go shake hands. But as he came down the steps, the police were saying, no, Governor, you're supposed to go this way. And he said, no, 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 I'm going to go shake hands. You know, he wasn't supposed to do that. But, you know, politicians, they're going to do that. Bremer's parents were interviewed. His father offered basic information about his son, but not much more. He did say that his son was a member of the Young Democrats Club. The father had not been in contact with his son since he left home seven months ago. His mother, on the other hand, was a chatterbox. She explained that their son had left home after getting in an argument with and striking his father. She had been in occasional contact with him, but sometimes he wouldn't open his door when she arrived. The FBI agent who interviewed her noted on the report that Mrs. Bremer, throughout the interview, exhibited signs of emotional stress and at times spoke irrationally. She told the agent that her son may have been motivated in an assault on Governor Wallace, 
due to his frustrations and failing to achieve what he felt was his just status in society. Mrs. Bremer asserted that bodyguards of presidential candidates should not allow people to get so close to the individuals. This was his mother. The most revealing interview, however, was with a 16-year-old girl in Milwaukee who dated Bremer for a few months until January 1972. Quote, she terminated the relationship with Bremer as she became frightened of him and as he caused her mental anguish. Bremer told her he was attracted to her as she did not fit into the world and neither did he, but he constantly harassed her on the phone and in person. The girl said she became more and more frightened of Bremer because of his weird interest in her supposed problems with her friends, his unnerving stares, and the intensity of his temper. When Bremer became angry, his face would become red and he would seem to smolder within himself. Bremer told her his mother beat him and he was frequently required to accompany his father to local taverns where his father became drunk. Bremer said his father was abusive to him. Now, if there's any doubt about his sanity, Bremer confided some peculiar sexual problems to the 16-year-old. I'll let you read that yourselves. I asked a nurse friend of mine who had experience everywhere in, in, in medicine, ERs, cardiac, you name it. And I said, so what sort of medication would that be? And when she finished laughing, she said, there is no such medication. So the chaos of the day was described in an interview with Barbara Luber of the Laurel Volunteer Rescue Squad, which responded to the emergency within two minutes. Something else that Dave Mitchell told me was before they got there, in the two minutes before they got there, uh, the police kept going around all the police cars trying to get one to open, but they were all locked to put, to put him somewhere until the rescue squad got there. Luber said, we attempted to take the blood pressure, but with all the people on the ambulance and all the noise, it was impossible. There were two agents in the front with the driver, and there were two more agents, a press secretary and Mrs. Wallace in the back, as well as myself, Duckworth, and Fiedler, who were paramedics. It was very crowded. We had a very hard time using our equipment due to the crowded conditions we were working under. When asked if the crowd in the ambulance prevented effective treatment of Mr. Wallace, Luber responded, yes. They did not mean to, but they interfered. All, were cons all they were concerned with was hurry Mr. Wallace to the hospital. In a report filed by Lieutenant James Fitzpatrick of the PGPD, he describes taking care of Bremer at PGPD headquarters in Hyattsville. Bremer had a laceration on his head and needed medical attention, but Fitzpatrick knew both Leland and Prince George's hospitals were heavily crowded with spectators who followed all the victims to the crime scene. Bremer was brought to Dr. Terrence McGuire for treatment at his medical office, which was cleared and entered through a rear door. While waiting for his x-ray, PG detectives read him his rights and asked, what happened at the Laurel Shopping Center? Bremer replied, I'm glad, I'm glad. While en route to PG Hospital after receiving the x-ray, Bremer asked, where's my car? He indicated the vehicle was parked at the Laurel Shopping Center, which was news to the police. The files contain hundreds of police photos. The police were meticulous in photographing everything from the scene before the shooting to every piece of evidence uncovered in the investigation. All of the clothes worn by the four people shot by Bremer, Wallace, a Secret Service agent, an Alabama state trooper, and a local Wallace campaign worker that were removed for surgery are also in the photos. There were hundreds and hundreds of them. Mixed in with the Laurel Shopping Center investigation are a series of photos taken at the Wheaton rally earlier in the day. The crowd scenes from Wheaton and Laurel are in stark contrast. Wheaton had many protesters holding signs such as this one, Remember Selma. The Laurel crowd looked to be much more supportive and attentive. even with all the hippies. So here's a before picture when they were getting set up. And then this is that night after the crowd cleared. 
There's a series of photos showing Bremer's car at the shopping center being dismantled for searching and then reassembled, although I have a feeling they gave him the parts back in a bunch of boxes. As I mentioned, Laurel resident Joe Kundrat took some of the most famous photos of the day, which were bought by the Associated Press uh, and appeared in newspapers and magazines around the world. We've already seen some of them, but I wanted to group them together here. So I'll just cycle through some of these. Joe took all of these photos. Joe was uh, two years above me in high school, so he'd already graduated. But Joe was one of those kids that he always had a camera, always had a camera around his neck. And he's got a tremendous photo collection. He was in the right place at the right time. So I would say he was 19, something like that, yeah. Joe? He was a mailman in Laurel for his whole career. He's just retired. No, no. And he did tell me he got screwed by some of these media organizations that were supposed to pay him. Actually, he did tell me that uh, the Star, Washington Star reporter, grabbed him, saw he had a camera, and drove him down to the Star building so that he could develop the film right there so they could have first dibs on it. A lot of these stores have been around for many years. As I said, so. It, his stuff appeared in a lot of different magazines. I'm sure that's in there, but I don't remember. Well, he shot, I think he shot five times, so there might have been one more. This is his most famous photo. You might even recognize this one. This was everywhere. This one, obviously, the Baltimore Sun used. So what happened to Bremer? After only a five-day trial, Arthur Bremer was convicted in August of 1972 and sentenced to 63 years. He, found, he was found sane after prosecutors read from his diary, which you saw in that clip. Now, Dave Mitchell told me a story that I'd never heard before. So the... Uh, the prosecutor was a guy named Arthur Bud Marshall in PG County. That name may or may not ring any bells. So his job was to actually prove that Bremer was not insane, although he clearly was insane. And in this diary that they found, Bremer wrote that on his way from Wheaton to Laurel, he stopped somewhere for gas. And then he checked his oil. It needed oil. So he put a quart of oil in. So he paid, he got in his car, and was on the road back to Laurel, and he realized he forgot to pay for the oil. So he turned around and went back. And according to Bud Marshall, that proved he was sane. It worked. He ended up serving 50, 35 years at the Maryland Correctional Institution in Hagerstown, 
and was released early in 2007 for good behavior. Upon his release, Newsweek quoted a forensic psychiatrist as saying, no assassin has ever been freed from custody in the United States. The magazine also described Bremer as he walked out of prison. Gone with a blonde head of hair and eerily cemented smile, now 57, Bremer is balding and paunchy with a long gray beard. Arthur Bremer is alone, says a Maryland correction spokesman. He has no one. He's also not allowed to leave the state. So what happened to Wallace? He lives in Cumberland. No, he's, he's alive. He lives in Cumberland. The Washington Post has a couple of times tried to talk to him. He won't talk to anybody. Apparently the people of Cumberland know him. They know who he is. They just leave him alone. He doesn't bother anybody. He works in a, a bookstore, I think. So, yeah. Like any good politician, Wallace campaigned from his hospital bed. He won the Maryland primary that, the, that was held the day after the shooting, but his campaign was over. After almost two months, he was released from Holy Cross Hospital in Silver Spring with his family by his side. And of course, Governor Marvin Mandel. Politicians are politicians, you know. They're not going to pass up a photo op. But he never walked again despite years of therapy and surgeries. So, any questions? I'm going to leave this up as a reminder. I don't, they all lived. That's all I know. Yeah, no one else died. Um, I, I, I'd run it again, but it would take too long to find it. But in that clip from that documentary, when the shots went, there was a guy off to the side, and you can see him grab. That was the Secret Service agent that got shot. But no, they all survived. The woman was named Dora Walker. She was the campaign worker, and she lived in Laurel. But I don't know what happened to her. Yes, sir? I'm sorry? He's the only one at that time to have been released. Right. Hinkley. Yeah, he got released. I, 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 yeah. But at the time, he was the first assassin ever to be released. So, yes. He shot five bullets. Oh, again, I know this is in the files. I don't know how many of the five. He was shot numerous times. I don't know if all five got him. I don't know. There was one in, in his spine. No, there were four people shot, including Wallace. There was Wallace, one of the Secret Service agents, a campaign worker, and the Alabama, one of the Alabama State Troopers. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, he was 57 in 2007, so you can do the math, because I sure can't. That sounds about right, yeah. Yes, sir. I don't know. I can only tell you what I found in those files. Um, I don't know. I, I think my guess is because he was so controversial that they probably gave him more, um, especially after what happened in Wheaton. Wheaton was a terrible, terrible rally. I mean, they cut it short. Uh, he, he, he only spoke for a few minutes. He was supposed to you know, give his usual, whatever, hour-long thing. Um, so it makes sense that they would do that. But what was the normal contingent? I have no idea. Especially back then. Everything was so different back then. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Kids from Laurel were getting bussed down to Largo. I remember that. I didn't. I, 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 it must have been the lower grades. I, I don't know, but I, I do remember that. Largo was a brand new high school at the time. Anything else? Yes. Right on the Beltway. Do you know where the Redskins Stadium is? Yeah. It's right on the other side of the Beltway from that. Which is now a shopping center. Which is now a shopping center. And they, 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 they thought they were going to be clever and call it Capital Center Boulevard or something like that. And they misspelled center. 
So it's like, you know, because it was always, it was C-E-N-T-R-E, -E, you know, classy, you know. But you'd think they'd get that right, so. Oh my God, the stories. All right, I'll have to tell you a couple of these stories. So we're talking about the Capitol Center now, not Wallace, okay? Let's make sure you understand that. So the band, the police, was playing. And this guy that I talked to, he and his partner were setting up a concession stand on the concourse and they were doing t-shirts and hats and stuff. And so a few hours before the show, as they're getting set up, Sting and Stuart Copeland, who were in the police, they're wandering by and they stopped and they start rifling through the t-shirts. Well, these guys had no idea who they were. And one of them said to him, hey, hey, you can't do that. We're not open yet. And Sting said to him, it's okay, we're with the police. And he thought he meant the Prince George's County Police. And he said, well, then you should know better. Get away from our stuff. And he says, no, really, we're with the police. And he said, I heard you the first time. Get away from our stuff. So Sting apparently got his nose out of joint and went backstage and told his manager, I'm not going on until that guy apologizes to me. So they sent a contingent up to the concourse and they explained what happened. And this guy said, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not going to apologize. But his partner, the guy that I interviewed, said, I said to him, oh, man, you got to go apologize. We're out thousands of dollars if they don't have this show. So he says, all right. So he went down and apologized. So the show went on. And another guy told me when Elton John was playing, they had this dramatic entrance all set up where the stage was pitch black. And there was a staircase leading up to the stage. And Elton, this is back in his days when he had, you know, feathers and, yeah, heels this high and all this kind of stuff. Well, this guy and another guy were assigned to escort him up the stairs and get him safely onto the stage in pitch black. So they went through this one door, and he said, I'll let go of the door. I thought my partner was right behind me, and the door went, bam, and hit Elton John right in the face. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, we're fired. Oh, no. But he said Elton was really pretty, pretty cool about it. He said, uh, yeah, it happens. You just get me up on the stage. So, yeah. Oh, I got a million of these stories. The book is going to be so good. So. Oh, and here's the best one of all. It was for Reagan. They did a, an inaugural gala for Ronald Reagan. And Frank Sinatra put together the whole show. And everybody that I talked to said, oh, they were starstruck because everybody in Hollywood was there. Well, Dean Martin was one of the performers, but he showed up so drunk that he couldn't even sit in a, in a chair. And so they couldn't let him go on. So apparently... At one point during the show, Frank Sinatra infused the whole situation by telling Dean Martin, oh, you already sang, man, you were great. <laughs> and he bought it, so. <laughs> How drunk do you have to be to buy that, you know? But, but he did, so. Oh, there's a million stories. Any other questions about Capital Center or, or Arthur Bremer? No, 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 I've spent the last two months interviewing all these folks. Oh, none of these are my stories. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but they all have Grateful Dead stories. Oh, my God, there's a million Grateful Dead stories. Um, Abe Poland, at one point they built, they, 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 the staff kept expanding, so they built this office building behind the Capitol Center. And back then they had window air conditioners. And when the deadheads were in town, you know, they camp out. They don't go anywhere. And some of them were taking showers under the condensation coming off the air conditioners. And Abe Poland was not happy with that outside his window. So, uh, <laughs> oh, the dead. Oh, and another one, the lady who was in charge of the sky suites, those very expensive suites around the top, some of the deadheads shimmied up onto the roof. She, this day, she says, I don't know how they did that. And they went into the ventilation shaft trying to get in for free. She says, well, guess where the ventilation shafts uh, lead to? The sky suites. So here a bunch of hippies drop out of the ventilation shaft into these very expensive sky suites. And I look like I'm going to fly in a wall for that one. Anyway, anyway, that's enough of that. Buy the book if you want to hear the rest of them. Well, I mean, I had long hair like everybody else, you know. Everybody did. So, you know. I mean, I was in high school, so we, we couldn't really classify yet, you know. You had to be in college, I think, to be an actual one. There was no badge or anything, you know. Yes, sir? I don't remember how long Bob lived. 
Actually, that um, video, one of the reasons why I recommend it so highly is it does talk about all the, the effects afterwards. And he died, uh, I think it was the late 90s or the early 2000s. I want to say that. And for the last few years of his life, he atoned for everything. And there was footage of him going around to these black churches in Alabama. And they were embracing him. And they, they, they you know, it was very, very uh, remarkable. So all of that is in that documentary. I thought it was the last few years. Okay, could be. Well, yeah, he, he, his wife stood in for him, and you know, he, yeah, he manipulated that whole thing a lot. But yeah, you're right, he did come back because he was term limited. Yes, sir. Did he have children? Yes. Well, one of them was in that clip. I think there was three. I know he had a daughter because I remember seeing her in some of the photos, but um, don't know anything about him, except for the guy that was talking in the, in the, the clip. Any more? Yes, sir. Do you know what place he was? No idea. No, I want to say Baptist, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. All right, thank you all. Thank you.